Hello, welcome to this shorter Lit in Fire video on Ian McEwan's Atonement, looking at some key quotations from the end of part three in relation to crime and crime ideas, and what the text says back, or kind of the ideas or problems or questions it poses in relation to those crime ideas. Just a quote from Buddha here in the opening slide. Uh, Holding on to anger is like grasping a hot coal with the intent of throwing it at someone else. You are the one getting burned. So I wanted to raise that in terms of Bryony Tallis, certainly the older Bryony Tallis, who is unable to achieve or bring about any meaningful form of atonement. As we know by now, Robbie Turner and her sister Cecilia are dead. So she is left burdened with this sense of guilt, which she can't do anything to atone for. Well, when we say anything, perhaps the only thing she can do to atone for it uh, is this fabricated reunion uh, at the end of part three, during which Bryony's fictitious version of Robbie, fictitious version of Cecilia, scold her and give her the kind of anger and resentment and bitterness uh, she's been denied from receiving. So people disagree on how sympathetically they regard Bryony, uh, whether they have any sympathy for her at all, whether they have a lot of sympathy. That's entirely up to you, OK? But in a strange sort of interesting paradox, we are starting to consider the idea of the criminal or one of the criminals, certainly not the main criminal in McEwen's atonement, having some sense of victimhood because of their criminal behaviour, completely unable to do anything with the burden of guilt. Well, or not much. She doesn't have a time machine. She can't go back and change the behaviour of her younger self. So in terms of the hot coal, uh, consider that in terms of the older Bryony Tallis here uh, and how able she is to resolve this or let go of her guilt because she can't receive the justified anger of Robbie Turner and Cecilia. Okay, some ideas that are key to the following slides. Let's move on. We're going to start at slide seven, but a reminder of these typical elements of crime. All right. So these are the ones that are going to be of most use to us uh, in these final few chapters. Uh, and these are going to be what I'm going to tie the analysis into as we go through these final quotations. All right. Remember, these are important for AO4. So whatever you're arguing about, Bryony, Robbie Turner, uh, whatever the examiner chooses to set a question on, you need to be touching base with all this lot quite frequently, uh, whichever ones are applicable, of course. Remember I showed you the format of the exam, how you've got to think tactically between which one you ch of these three you choose for section B, and then whichever one you choose for there, the remaining two will have to be done for section C. So you write about all three of them across B and C. OK, so one of these instances of the fabricated anger here, of this fictitious, and fabricated version of Cecilia, which older Bryony creates here in this reunion scene. So you can see here uh, this term of address that they used when they were close and, you know, before all the uh, undeserved punishments of Robbie Turner with these kind of false witness statements and all these kinds of stuff. So... Uh, younger Bryony or older Bryony has her younger self use this term of address towards her sister as they did of old but see and then that's interrupted she snapped don't call me that she repeated uh, in a softer voice please don't call me that okay so there's a reminder uh, and this is this idea of self-scolding again that the past has gone uh, that previous levels of intimacy and closeness, family bonds they had as two sisters, is gone, is broken, uh, cannot be retrieved due to uh, the follies of her youth, her past mistakes. So we also get more scolding here. Again, though, it's self-scolding, yes. This is older Bryony, the narrator, in a framing narrative, important for AO2. 
creating this version of Cecilia to scold her younger self. What I paid two guineas to discover is this. There isn't going to be an appeal just because five years on you've decided to tell the truth. Okay, these stinging reminders, these stinging, barbed, sort of scolding remarks, which older Bryony is unable to receive due to, as we later learn or belatedly learn, the death of uh, Robbie and Cecilia, just, you know, through natural sort of means, old age, war, this kind of stuff. But they are inserted in there as a way of receiving the punishment. She's been unable to receive, but clearly feels she absolutely deserves. OK, so we must remember that this encounter, this exchange, uh, this conversation between Cecilia and Bryony is utterly fabricated. It is not real. It did not happen. Please bear that in mind over the following quotations. So the way you should discuss this if you're choosing to use this for evidence and to make your arguments is that this is fabricated for the purpose of self-scolding, all right? So as far as we know, Bryony, older Bryony, has never had any scolding off, any judgment uh, from Cecilia or Robbie. So she invents this in order to sort of fulfill that really uh that idea to be sort of punished i guess uh as we'll see in a moment some of it borders on martyrdom uh she wants to stand there and she wants to take and receive the anger particularly from robbie but don't forget this never happened so this is all done with some kind of psychological self-scolding here uh, the punishment, the judgment, good crime words for AO4, she never ever actually received. So she'll fabricate it instead. She's a novelist. She always has been a fantasist. I think that's the word Cecilia uses about her. Uh, so the only way she can sort of receive that judgment, which she obviously feels she deserves, is to fabricate it uh, through a fictitious episode like this one. This is an interesting moment to talk about the idea of truth within crime, okay? And how truth is contingent. C O N T I G E N T, all right? C O N T, sorry if I spelled that incorrectly. Um, what I mean by that is uh, truth is only a relative thing and it's sort of time bound. So we're going to see here how Bryony felt at the time she was acting perfectly legitimately uh, and pursuing truth. But the truth of her actions have, over time, come to be seen as false and flawed uh, and ultimately wrong. But, as we're going to see now, she honestly believed that her actions were compelled by a sense of righteousness and justice then. So... The truth of something can change. That's what we mean by contingent. A contingent truth. So look closely here. This is absolutely to do with self-scolding. Sometimes we've called it sort of self-flagellation. Uh, sort of whipping yourself in terms of guilt. Metaphorically and fictitiously, of course. This hasn't happened. So her sister's confirmation of her crime was terrible to hear. So she wants you to see the pain that this causes her. Whether you agree that she's worthy of the reader's sympathy, that's entirely up to you. But she does point out the pain uh, and the cost of this to her. There's a key cause. But the perspective was unfamiliar. This is a novel deeply concerned with how perspective and individual points of view can be flawed, can be completely contradictory to how one person sees it compared to another. Look at these adjectives uh, about her younger self. Weak, stupid, confused, cowardly, evasive. She had hated herself for everything she had been. This is the interesting bit here for me. But she had never thought of herself as a liar. So that's an epiphany, a sort of revelation that, well, you know, I think it's unfair to call me a liar. She behaved according to the truth of that moment at that time. A contingent truth. And yet for a moment she even thought of defending herself. 
interesting there's maybe still a little flicker or a trace of the ego there um from the younger Bryony. all right does she really have anything to defend herself about but it seems the label don't forget robbie turner has been labeled as criminal falsely the label of liar is something that doesn't sit too well with older Bryony here uh, and she wants to kind of challenge that to a small degree so an attempt here at sort of acknowledging that younger, sorry, older Bryony is beyond forgiveness. Okay, in a novel called Atonement, there's this idea that she's done something so reprehensible, so unforgivable, that she's beyond forgiveness. And there's that self-scolding down the bottom. Fictitious, obviously, but... Um, if she had the power to fictionalise this and imagine uh, a reunion with her sister, she could easily have fabricated, don't worry sis, we all do crazy things, particularly when we're young, never mind, cup of tea. That doesn't happen. So she doesn't afford herself any forgiveness there. Uh, punishing, self-scolding, etc. This is a great bit of detail here in the AO2 description of the setting, okay? And if I can't go to court, that won't stop me telling everyone what I did. His sister gave a wild little laugh. Uh, look at this description. It's absolutely brilliant. This is, of course, just describing Cecilia's flat. But what else does this sound like? This narrow room with its stripes like bars. OK, so paralleling anyone of Robbie Turner uh, with his actual imprisonment. So um, again, we've had parallels drawn with Bryony helping soldiers uh, and you know kind of the influx of wounded people uh, in her ward there's been that sort of cheeky parallel don't worry to like that in your essay between her on the hospital ward and Robbie Turner in the battlefield it's not a neat or you know accurate parallel is it it's maybe giving you an idea of Bryony's own torment but I think that Ian McEwan is inviting you to look at that parallel as unequal, okay? The horrors and the hell she inflicted on Robbie from her crime in no way sort of equates or balances with, I think, you can disagree, of course, uh, the stuff that Bryony endures on the wards. Just a little note there as well, you might pick up on this. Uh, she was, after all, in, part, in a part of the conversation, Bryony, she had rehearsed. Where does that drag us straight back to? The trials of Arabella, perhaps, in the opening chapters, with that awful kind of brutal bullying of rehearsal. So again, some brilliant paralleling here, which triggers memories of the crime, which has set this all in motion. And how, kind of woven into the narrative here, older Bryony is not letting her younger self forget her previous transgressions, to use a good word from that crime sheet, her previous crimes and wrongdoing. Okay, so at the moment when Robbie Turner magically reappears and just kind of strolls into his kitchen nonchalantly and, oh, he's alive, oh my goodness, never saw that coming. Well, it didn't, this is fabricated, let's not forget that, okay? Slightly earlier on a previous slide, I spoke about how... The torment and the pain of Bryony is being foregrounded here. It's up to you whether you sympathise, some sympathy, no sympathy, but that's, you know, your call. Um, have a look at this, though. Still feeling nauseous and now hot, Bryony pressed her cheek against the wall. It was no cooler than her face. She longed for a glass of water, but she did not want to ask her sister for anything. So there's guilt there's a you know a really powerful manifestation of guilt, the psychology of the criminal, for want of a better term. Don't forget, though, she's not fully convicted and never is. So we need to say maybe a transgressive figure uh, or someone who's committed a moral, morally committed a crime, uh, but not not you know judged for it or sentenced for it. Um, but look at the torment she's going through here. <clears throat> And the effects of guilt. This is almost bordering on martyrdom. All right. So where you refuse anything to make life more comfortable or less painful for you. 
she did not want to ask her sister for anything, even a glass of water. So she's kind of feeling a bit sort of hot and about to pass out here. But she doesn't feel deserving of even, you know, the smallest of things like a glass of water. Effects of guilt there, I think. That's a useful little section to illustrate that. Again, you might talk about the effects of guilt here, look. So... Uh, Bryony wanted to tell Cecilia how wonderful it was that Robbie had come back safely. He hasn't. What deliverance. Okay. You might hear a sort of echo of the Lord's Prayer in there. Um, so that's an idea of forgiveness. That might be the idea that, well, okay, at least he didn't die in the war. I'm not, I don't have that on me or over me uh, to feed my guilt. But look at what it's followed by. How banal, how ridiculous that would have sounded. She, Bryony, had no business saying it. So look at how she has to deny wants and needs and her emotions. There's the plight of being guilty there. Interesting parallel here between the sisters. P there for parallel. Um, Cecilia being busy in the kitchen. Or was she, Cecilia, soothing herself by being busy? Well, we've gone through a quote uh, from Bryony on the ward, which is suggesting exactly that, okay? Remember the scrubbing and the busyness and healing soldiers as a sort of surrogate or deferred way of trying to care for Robbie? We did that excellent passage where the, precisely that is said. But um, the devil makes work for idle hands. If you're guilty or have a guilty conscience, it seems the sisters uh, are both preoccupied with being extremely busy to stop any reflection uh, on the harm they've caused. Cecilia, obviously less culpable or less to blame uh, for the faith of Robbie. She obviously loves him. Just a quick quote here that I thought I'd pick up on. Uh, there's a reference to a double take here. If you recall some of the early chapters, maybe three, four, five, could be six and seven, kind of a bit hazy on the numbers, uh, a double take. So with this idea of perspective, an event happens uh, and then the next chapter which follows on just sort of rewinds about two minutes. Don't wait it like that in your essay. And then comes at the same incident from the perspective of another character to give you an extra or a different take or perspective on events. OK, so I thought it was quite interesting that um, McEwen puts that in his novel. But as an actual quote... You could use that if you're talking about the structure and the way the story is told in certain chapters. OK, an interesting moment here, looking at the reaction of Robbie. It isn't the reaction of Robbie. I keep emphasising this is fabricated. This is not true. This is old O'Brieny self-scolding and maybe adding in uh, or replacing or inserting the judgement and the anger and the frustration. She never endured or suffered or you know she merits it but that has been denied to her so in a sort of self-scolding way here she is putting it in the mouth of Robbie Turner who isn't alive to actually vent his anger and frustration at her so uh, if you look at this quote here uh, I'll be quite honest with you I'm torn between breaking your stupid neck here and taking you outside and throwing you down the stairs OK, so that's very justifiable, I guess. Um, that's Bryony imagining the justifiable, you know, absolutely just and legitimate and valid, use those kind of words, reactions that a wronged man, someone who has been done a wrong uh, or, you know, falsely convicted, would absolutely feel in that situation. So self-scolding here, but it has to be fabricated. Robbie wasn't reunited with Brian in any way, shape or form uh, to do this. So she fabricates it. OK, I love this moment from this chapter. Uh, this is Bryony almost making a martyr of herself here. Um, wanting, I guess, uh, to be on the receiving end of Robbie's ire and anger, his frustration, uh, his completely justifiable rage. Uh, at being reunited with the woman who has caused so much misery and pain in his life. Uh, not so much caused, not just caused him misery and pain, denied him happiness as well. So I think they're different things really, uh, which you could use depending on which argument you want to make. So 
here's Brian. He's speaking from experience about wounded soldiers. So you know, in lots of pain on a, on the ward, uh, raging against their helplessness. At the height of their passion, it was foolish to reason with them or try to reassure them. It their anger had to come out. It's like a poison or a I don't know a sting that has to be drawn out. Um, and it was best to stand and listen. She knew that even offering to leave now could be provocative. So she faced Robbie and waited for the rest. Her due. So what is owed to her? Uh, what she deserves. Okay, self-flagellation, self-scolding. Um, that's a very important quote, I think, in terms of the idea of martyrdom. There's a painting by Rubens of St. Sebastian, the first martyr. Uh, I've been, had the pleasure of seeing that in the Louvre a million years ago. Um, and it's that idea of accepting your faith and your punishment um, because you feel you're deserving of it. Uh, so some people today say, oh, you're being a martyr, uh, sort of, you know, milking how much pain you're in um, for attention, really. Uh, and arguably there's elements of that here. Uh, so look at waited, stand, listen, waited for the rest. So very passive, but she feels she's absolutely deserving of that. Her due. Now again, we have older Bryony fabricating this. So the bit where Robbie goes, have you got any idea at all what it's like? Sort of forces her to imagine. Uh, and she's putting herself through that because she feels it's her due. That's such a neat little two-word quote. I think you can keep using on lots of occasions, I think. So she imagines what the prison is like. Uh, no hiding away from it. Gone now is the adolescent that didn't care. Do you remember that line earlier on that said, well, I didn't really think about it again. And during my adolescence, I was far too busy doing adolescent-y things. Uh, but now she's confronting that. To steady herself, she was trying to concentrate on the details of his, Robbie's, transformation. Now, look at the sort of praise she's given him here, all right? And this is absolutely soaked in the guilt of a sinful criminal person, albeit an unconvicted criminal. Look at the dignity she gives him here. This is very heroic in the way she portrays him. Because she loves him and she's full of guilt for what she did. So, added height... Uh, because of the way he's been sort of shaped and moulded uh, by his military career, parade, ground, posture. Then she just happens to remember he's not just an impressive, brave soldier as well. He's also a graduate of Cambridge. No Cambridge student ever stood so straight. So academic, heroic. Even in his distraction, his shoulders were well back, chin raised like an old-fashioned boxer's. So tough, uh, proud, intelligent, uh, taller somehow she's almost making him like a monument uh, giving him a sort of statuesque quality because she admires him and absolutely feels loaded with guilt about how the ruin she's caused to his life so there's an attempt to bestow or put upon him or represent him in those heroic terms purely out of guilt also, as well to sort of restore his legacy and um, the labelling as a criminal, the public humiliation and shame we saw when he was carted away. Um, she has to overturn that somehow. She has to try and rectify and restore out of guilt uh, some dignity to Robbie. Interesting simile here. Uh, obviously, she's being scolded here or she's doing the scolding through her constructs, the characters she's created. She had thought about this conversation many time, times. Look at this simile. Like a child anticipating a beating. All right. If that isn't sort of a desire to be punished, uh, psychological guilt, then I don't know what is. I mean, the simile is almost wishing she could return back to when she was such a precocious egotist. And you could argue that the suggestion is that uh, if an older parental figure uh, was around to administer or give the younger Bryony uh, a beating, then perhaps some of her ways might have been altered uh, and we wouldn't have had that such of such arrogance, really, uh, who thought they were going to be campaigning for justice in a deeply flawed perception of things. 
just an interesting moment down the bottom here. Uh, obviously, none of this happened. This is all fabricated. I keep repeating that. Uh, but in terms of crime, I think this raises an interesting idea in terms of the unsayable. All right. Uh, so can anything be said to atone or remove the harm done previously? So what made you so certain now? She hesitated, conscious, aware that in answering she would be offering a form of defence. Almost implied under that is, there is no defence, a rationale for her actions. There is no rationale, and that it might enrage him further. So, we're getting towards the idea in crime here is that nothing can be said to atone, uh, or rectify, or remove, or remedy. Lots of words beginning with R, E here, but they all seem to fit. Uh, what has been done and what cannot be undone. You see that in a number of crime texts, I think. Within this fabricated chapter, older Bryony can't ignore the fact that all of this stemmed from One Summer by the Lake. Uh, I think it's page 228 in most editions of the novel, somewhere around there anyway. So... There's kind of the toll this is all taken on him a little bit now. Just before that was how proud, how tall, how sort of his chin was upright. He's a Cambridge graduate. Gone the reverse angle here. Uh, really changed, hardness in his gaze, smaller, narrower, um, wrinkles around his eyes, thinner face. But <clears throat> then we come back to this. He was startlingly handsome. And there came back to her from years ago when she was 10 or 11, the memory of a passion she'd had for him. A real crush that had lasted days. Then she confessed it to him one morning in the garden and immediately forgot about it. So we're always looking in our crime texts for paper two of the psychological sort of motivations behind crime. Roger Ackroyd, it's money. Sometimes passion as well. But mostly money, the root of all evil. Here, I don't really want to say a crime of passion but a crime caused by a juvenile crush. So it is still related to the heart uh, and feelings and love, uh, albeit this kind of juvenile form. But they're behind most criminal actions, aren't they? Certainly in the crime writings we look at, Browning, um, money and exploitation, in Peter Crabbe, all those kind of things, you know? Uh, so they're always useful and may form some kind of section C question in crime writing I'm just making this up now uh, vices or the seven deadly sins are important motivations behind crime um, to what extent do you agree or explore the significance of sins in two crime texts you have studied just thinking out loud that might be the sort of angle they go for on section C Two things in this moment here. Again, it's all fabricated. Older Bryony behind all of this. Written to give her the sort of stings of guilt. And to punish herself, really. Um, if we look here, look at what anger does to Robbie. It sort of animalises him. A bit of zoomorphism here. So turning him into an animal look. Um, his face was tilted back. His lips retracted. And teeth bared. I don't know, I see an animal there. I know human beings have got teeth and we show them when we're angry. But in a ghoulish parody of a smile, it's almost a bit animalistic. Um, so, And that's maybe understandable. So there's a good man transformed into something approaching an animal. He was wrongly accused of behaving like one. There's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, I guess. Uh, those of you who do sociology might go down that route. If you're labelled as a criminal, society might treat you as one to the point where you end up becoming a criminal. Uh, similar idea in Othello. Iago goes around kind of perpetuating all the stereotypes about a black man. And then arguably by a certain point in the play, Iago has manipulated Othello so much. There he is acting like the savage barbarian and um, that. Iago was claiming Othello was earlier. All right. So there's a self-fulfilling prophecy idea. Um, here you're getting a pretty ten beautiful tender moment fabricated uh, by Cecilia's ability to sort of calm uh, Robbie here uh, and this kind of tender display of love and affection between them. Um, and obviously, you know, 
the quote here, which takes us right back to before everything was tarnished and ruined. So she pulled him closer, drawing him into her gaze until their faces met, and she kissed him lightly, lingering on the lips with a tenderness that Bryony remembered from years ago. So this is more guilty and more self-scolding. Um, this is the happiness and the kind of benefit to each other between Cecilia and Robbie, which Bryony has denied them both from her actions. Just quickly on these, look at how compliant and obedient um, the guilty Bryony is. So there are some things you are going to do for us. Uh, you've already agreed to, you are to go. Uh, when's your day off? Sunday. Uh, there's no kind of grumbling over that. You'll get on with it, you'll do it. So this is an attempt to atone. Um, you know, kind of Robbie laying down the orders here. In it, you will say what you did wrong and how you're retracting your evidence. Is that clear? Yes. Okay, very meek, very submissive and obedient, as you would expect when confronted with the person whose life you've ruined. An attempt at, of course, atonement. So here's the actual sort of revelation, the revealing of the genuine and actual criminal's name. We're obviously not a who done it, but that is a sort of who done it thing, the grand reveal uh, of the guilty party. Uh, however, look at this though in terms of perspective. And that point I raised before about the contingent nature of truth. Okay, so something was true or appeared true at the time. But that truth, in inverted commas, changes, perspective alters on it. I suppose that's getting to the point in terms of crime writing that, you know, guilty verdicts gives us a sense of deep unease that, you know, a conviction might actually be overturned or wrong. Uh, and, you know, there's no 100% solid guarantee that someone convicted of something may not always be completely or you know totally guilty that'll keep you awake at night maybe okay two absolutely key bits here i'm only going to do a couple more slides and then that'll do us for one particular lesson so there's robbie reactor well not robbie but you know the robbie's imagined reaction to the revelation of paul marshall being the guilty party uh, now this is a brilliant bit of paralleling here okay in terms of the structure uh so structure Paralleling is a form of structuring, okay? AQA, love it if you can start a sentence here and there, but structurally, comma, and away you go. So, given all that has happened and its terrible consequences, it was frivolous, she knew. But Bryony took calm pleasure in delivering her clinching news. So, Robbie's just said, No, not with Lola, they're fine, no, no chance. Uh, Bryony can confirm that is the case because she's just been the wedding. I've just come from the wedding. Now, it's this word here, clinching, all right? An absolutely brilliant use of paralleling here from Ian McEwen, all right? The last time we saw the word clinching was in relation to when Bryony ran upstairs, uh, invaded Cecilia's private possessions and discovered the letter uh, with the disgusting word in it, all right? And that word was used clinching aha i will prove he is the monster uh that he is the beast i keep forgetting the word they use about him and um, the labeling word but that's so clever from McEwen uh to use that word again here at this moment now what's that trying to bring about well i'll give you a clue the title of the book okay so previously she's been that full of desire uh, to do what she thought was right by her sister, protecting her sister, ran upstairs, stole a private item, come back and produced it and gave it to the policeman and all that kind of thing. Clinching. So she felt then she was doing a sense of kind of moral righteousness. It turned out to be wrong and condemned an innocent man. Look at this attempt to atone here. All right. I can't believe it's Paul Marshall with Lola. Aha. I now have the clinching evidence in a bid to try and partially atone. Brilliant structuring, okay? So, well done that, Ian McEwen fella. Q 
key quote here from Cecilia, again, imagined to imagined Robbie. Uh, Celia starting to see how justice might be flawed uh, and sort of skewed and altered by kind of money and status. It shouldn't be the case, but we know that justice pretends to be blind, but justice isn't immune to receiving the brown paper envelope with lots of money to skew the outcome all right so cecilia is saying here he paul marshall as we later learn in the london 1999 section lord and lady marshall no less of the marshall foundation he's immune she'll always cover for him all right so money isn't explicitly mentioned there but i do think it's a bit of a nod or alludes to um, the protected sort of status um, he has from being a rich man. Okay, so there's reference to greedy. Uh, and if you remember in lessons, I've mentioned that brilliant quote from King Lear, which talks beautifully about justice. Plate sin in gold, and then that sin disappears. So basically the idea that if you're rich, justice doesn't apply to you. All right. Uh, she'll always cover for him. Um, so that's important in terms of justice being deeply flawed and skewed uh, and open to sort of influence when it shouldn't be. It should be impartial. And there's a reason why the statue on top of the Old Bailey is blindfolded. Justice is meant to be impartial. But if you're deeply cynical like me, uh, you don't believe in that for a moment. Another brilliant structure in parallel here as well. Uh, this is um, Bryony thinking, right, I've, got, I've said my piece here. I'm kind of, you know, unwanted in the flat. I need to go now. Uh, and then we have this line. She, Bryony, had the impression of being seen off the premises. Remind you of any particular incident, a parallel there? Um, poor Robbie Turner being escorted off the Talis estate and that kind of real indignity of being marched away in cuffs in front of his sort of, I guess is like his surrogate family. And that really heart-rending scene when his mother uh, ran up and stopped the car and started bashing it with an umbrella like some kind of mad Mary Poppins. Don't put that in your essay. Uh, but escorted off the premises is a nod towards criminality, I think. A place where you don't belong and uh, have no entitlement to be in. Definitely recalls that moment of Robbie Turner. So here's the separation. Here are the three saying their goodbyes. Again, all entirely fabricated. Um, the important thing, though, given that it's fabricated, we do get this look. Then it was over. They, Cecilia and Robbie, stared at her, waiting for her to leave. But there was one thing she had not said. She spoke slowly. I am very, very sorry. I've caused you such terrible distress. They continued to stare at her. See, they, there's nothing to say back in relation to that. Um, the words are empty. They can't undo or fix the harm she's caused. So, sorry has been said, but it doesn't do anything to rectify or restore. And she repeated herself, I'm very sorry. It, the apology, sounded so foolish and inadequate, as though she had just knocked over a favourite houseplant or forgotten a birthday. Robbie didn't, imagined, fabricated, said softly, just do all the things we've asked. It was almost conciliatory, okay, to reconcile, to make up. Um, so this is older Bryony, <sighs> deeply flawed uh, and, you know, deeply unproven, totally fabricated. There's Bryony, sort of, I guess, who would like to think that Robbie had it in him uh, to show some slight degree of reconciliation and to make up and to mend their relationship a little bit. But all we get is one just scabby adverb, that just. But not quite conciliation, not yet. Now that's interesting, that's forward looking and it's total guesswork because uh, it's fabricated. Um, I think Alder Bryony is suggesting that eventually over time Robbie Turner may have forgiven it, but that's purely wish fulfilment, I think, 
and not something that can be proven. Okay, the closing of part three here before we get, as you can see, which I'll do a separate video about, uh, into London 1999. Uh, notice it ends BT. So there's your little first kind of clue uh, that, oh, Brownie Tallis has been in charge of everything that we've seen before. So she's the author narrator, don't forget, that's the best way of putting it. She has been totally in charge of how we see these characters even to the point of gross distortion of the truth with this imagined meeting between the three of them. Okay, so if you look at the conclusion to part three here, uh, I guess conclusion to the sort of inner narrative before we have the illusion spoiled and Bryony reveals that she's the author of all of this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Look at the sort of slight tones of um, being heroic here. Uh, a slight suggestion of forgiveness, but the ability or the possibility to atone. So we've got Bryony here strolling away. Uh, she was calm and she considered what she had to do. So she's endowed with a purpose here to go and rectify and put right. So it is sort of in heroic terms here for now, before we have the whole illusion spoiled. Together, the note to her parents in the formal statement would take no time at all. Then she would be free, got to come back to that word in a moment, for the rest of the day. She knew what was required of it. Not simply a letter, but a new draft, an atonement, and she was ready to begin. Okay, that's quite the sort of upbeat, uh, emphatic ending uh, to the sort of inner narrative, if you like. So there's someone who's kind of mended her ways. Uh, remember we spoke about that building's roman journey of growth and development. Not the precocious brat, uh, but someone who has toughed it out on the hospital wards and earned the approval of Sister Drummond. You know, that's no mean feat. Uh, Brian has turned her life around and become somewhat impressive figure uh so there is that sort of tone here but look um an honest admission really uh in terms of and an acknowledgement of the, the harm she's caused self uh directed harm as well i think so look it was her sister she missed or more precisely it was her sister with robbie their love that has been the casualty uh, and of course she had the crush on robbie herself but she's deprived her sister who she loved of happiness with the man she loved uh okay so neither bryony nor the war had destroyed it their love fictitious fabricated this was what soothed her as she bryony sank deeper under the city so there are these moments here a possibility of forgiveness and reconciliation okay um but it's obviously fabricated you can view that a different way of course because this journey the one where she's trying to redeem and atone for everything she's done is actually about to start at the end of this chapter with the suggestion that the manuscript is going to be released and therefore incriminate the truly guilty.